The Fillmore is it's a term that I find very kind of difficult, you know, because, you know, what does it relate to black and white movies? No, they say, no, it relates to the landscape, the moral landscape or the ex existential landscape of the films. OK, I get that. Yeah. But uh, I mean, every movie I've made could be considered a film more, you know, apart from perhaps Breakfast on Pluto. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I was making a film that was drenched in sunlight with this movie, you know. It was making a film that was full of colour and full of, you know, the only noirish element to it is the, you know, the, the heart of the central character and the, the characters themselves who are, seem to live in a world of shadows, you know. John Banville, the, the, or a script is based on his book, The Black Eyed Blonde. Wonderful writer, I've always admired his work. And, uh, you know, I grew up watching Humphrey Bogart and Robert Mitchum, Stacey Keach, Elliot Gould, play Philip Marlowe. And I'm an avid reader. And strangely enough, I'd never read any Raymond Chandler until I was offered this. And then I just could not put it down. I have a Kindle as my best friend. And I would finish one of the stories and immediately start another one, you know. So I, I just got subsumed in, in with uh, Chandler. I thought he was an extraordinary writer. You know, I had seen the uh, Humphrey Bogart movie, you know, um, and I just, I, I don't know, I love, I, I, I haven't read the books of, of the series, but Marlowe is such an iconic character. Um, I'd worked with Liam before and I thought he'd be perfect for this. And I'm a really big fan of Neil Jordan's films, you know, so it was kind of a no brainer. Camera, festival, thank you very much. The film is so different from what John wrote. I mean, John is a friend of mine, you know, but it's totally different from what John wrote, you know, and it's, uh, I was sent, I was given this script. I was sent the script actually by a producer and Liam was already attached to it, you know, so when I read it, I thought, okay, I would love to get involved in this if I can, you know, make it my own in some way and make it, bring it up to date, make it more contemporary and use these familiar Chandlerian elements and, you know, provide some different kind of perspective on them, really, you know. And if, more particularly, if I could, if I could uh, you know, explore a character with Liam Neeson that was kind of exhausted by moral certainties, you know, and had to resign himself to the fact that he will live, always be living in a compromised world, you know, and that he, and to recognize that he himself is as compromised as everybody around him in a way. So it's, it's also, I mean, Liam has been playing characters full of certainty, you know, full of, he's, who's been defeating bad guys throughout the world. I thought, okay, let's, Liam, Let's explore somebody who doesn't shoot, you know, every bad guy he meets, who doesn't uh, involve himself in all of this moral kind of certainty, who's not a knight in shining armor, you know, or if, if he is, the armor is very, very rusty, you know. Let's examine a character who has to, uh, who has to realize how complex he himself is, you know, and how the world will never be what he imagines it should be. I just tried to make every scene as real as possible. And when I did add, I, I asked Neil, there's two thugs come in when I'm looking for uh, Nico, the guy that's disappeared. I'm coming, <coughs> excuse me, I'm coming to talk to his sister. And I, we get into a little bit of a fight and uh, I pick up a chair and hit one of the guys, and I, I just added, I'm getting too old for this. Neil said, keep that in. I thought, yeah, I will keep it in, it's good. <laughs> I, I'm getting too old for this. I, he can use silence in a very interesting way, you know, and there's, he can use, I think because he's physically so iconic, you know what I mean? He, there was a moment where uh, Aduale shot his boss, yeah, and took the money out of his pocket and went to Liam. And Liam just looks at him and he gives the very an almost imperceptible smile, you know what I mean? And only Liam can do that. Do you understand what I mean? I mean, perhaps another actor would have, you know, 
been chortling with, you know, kind of ironic laughter. But Liam just gives this tiny little smile like he, he can barely believe what he's seen. That was cool. It's good. I trusted him that he could see something in me and my development from when we first got to know each other around about 1980. I trusted his seeing something in my development of my career that he thought I'd be right for this interpretation of Marlowe. Totally trusted that, you know, didn't question it. And, uh, um, and enjoy working with him immensely. He's very quirky sometimes, but he's always, always thinking, you know. He has a vision. We really talked about iconic actors or actresses, really, and you know how he he Neil has a an opinion about everything. How he wanted my character to look, the color of my hair. Um, so he was he's very involved, you know. And he I, I love the dialogue. It's very uh, from another time, you know. It's kind of difficult to learn because it's so not spoken in a way, right? But it's really fun. It truly feels like sometimes like a play. Every, every femme in, in, a, in a Chandler movie, sorry, in a Raymond Chandler story is, is a fatale, isn't there? Is there, a, is there a femme that is not a fatale? There are a few librarians who remove their glasses and all that sort of stuff, but generally every woman has a, has a gun in her handbag, doesn't she? And every woman has a secret to hide and has an agenda. And, you know, it was a matter of exploring that kind of, that kind of conceit and having fun with it at the same time. She has all the mysteriousness um, and pretense of a classic femme fatale. Uh, and yet she's very much in control of her own destiny. And I love that. You know, I love that she ends up running the studio. So it did feel a more interesting arc to play. Usually they die or they get killed, right? Uh, heartbroken. Well, when the producers began to talk about the movie with me, I said, OK, well, let's uh Let's explore the idea of doing it in Barcelona, you know, because the architecture is not too dissimilar from what I could see remains of Los Angeles. You know, they always talk of Spanish Mediterranean as being the architectural style of classic Hollywood, you know. So it was like constructing it, a city that doesn't exist in a way. You know? Yeah, it's, you know, it's so fun to make period movies. It's, when you're an actor, I think you you feel like you're an actor. You're really an actor once you put on a, a costume like that, you know, because it's it just everything looks and feels like a movie. <laughs> you know, those those cars, like all those movies you watched growing up and that made you dream, or at least for me, they made me dream. Uh, you know, it's just it nourishes my soul. <laughs> There's nothing better than feeling like you are you know, 50, 60, 100 people trying to make something special. That bubble of making a film is so intoxicating. You know, it's hard work, truly. But it's so it's so rare um, to be able to feel like you're creating something that is emotional, right? That it's something that not everybody gets to do. Like you're truly there to just act out emotions and say lines and you have the support of so many people trying the best, you know, and to, to bring out your vulnerability. It's such a unique thing. Like, it's such an incredible thing. I've made 101 films now. That includes a bunch of documentaries I've narrated. But um, I just love the fact that a bunch of strangers come together every day. You form a type of a family. And they're there to make me look good and to tell this story that we're all involved in and uh, I think it's it's just great it really is from a high budget movie to a very low budget movie the buzz I get is, is still the same